Um, very excited to talk to you today about um, something that's incredibly important, I think, for our long-term survival, which is working with performance venues amidst COVID-19. Um, and to just sort of give you, well, actually, first, let me just say thank you all for being here. Thank you so much to Gala Courses for inviting me to do this presentation. Um, this is my first leadership symposium that I've been able to participate in. So I'm really, really just thrilled to be here and to get to know everyone here. Um, so everything started, you know, a couple months ago after the pandemic started, um, I was starting to work with choral organizations and I would hear a common problem, which is that, you know, we were trying to plan for our seasons ahead. We were trying to plan for, you know, a, as we do two years down the line, that sort of thing. And we weren't hearing back from concert venues. Um, so that was a common concern that was coming up a couple months ago. Um, and so I really started to do some digging into this topic. Um, I spoke at the New York Choral Consortium on this and started sort of planting the seeds of some of the challenges that venues were facing right now in the choral community. Um, and then I actually, from that presentation, which was maybe about a month ago, I started interviewing concert venues across the country. Um, so I was able to spend uh, a good chunk of time talking to about 20 different venues. Um, I really tried to get different types of venues um, from concert halls to outdoor venues, to churches, to universities and that sort of thing. Um, and what I'm gonna do today is sort of walk you through some of the conversations that I had with these different types of venues um, and share some of my key findings with you. Now, I will say that I started uh, this process by first going to um, saveourstages.com. Um, and I don't know if any of you have heard of the Save Our, uh, heard of the Save Our Stages Act, um, but it's essentially a piece of legislature that Amy Klobuchar put together and spearheaded uh, with people in her community to help basically provide relief funding for concert venues, independent concert venues. Um, so there's an organization, um, it's called NEVA, the National Independent Venues Association that's been working with them to try to make sure that venues can get relief funding throughout the pandemic. Um, and so on their website, they have hundreds of venues that are kind of a part of this movement. And so I'll start off by saying that I went to their website and found these venues. And so these venues are definitely venues that are particularly invested in making sure that they survive this pandemic. Um, so the data that I'm sharing with you today is not you know, like a random sampling of venues. It's very much the people that are invested in, in making sure that they survive and that the arts survive this pandemic. Um, so I'm gonna share with you some of this data, but it's, you know, also a small sampling. So take it with a little bit of a grain of salt, but just understand that this is a lot of the um, anecdotal information and the stories that I'm sharing with you today. I will definitely leave some time for questions at the end, feel free to put them in the chat as we go, happy to answer them as we go. Um, and I hope that this is a little bit of an interactive experience too, that we can really talk about your specific challenges today. All right, so enough of that. I have one really quick disclaimer for you, which is that when I'm talking about working with performance venues, I, I don't want people to go off and say, Tori's told us that we can plan all the in-person performances that we want and we're good to go with live performances. This is not, that advice. Um, I am just sharing with you like how you can start those conversations with venues. Obviously, please, please, please stay informed with what's going on in your local areas with the pandemic um, before planning any type of in-person performance or anything like that. So that's my one disclaimer. Um, Dwight's already introduced me, so uh, I just have this slide in here for you for later. Um, I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at Chorus Connection. I've been a board president. I've been um, a music director. I've been a singer. I've been a section leader. I've been a marketer. Um, so I've been in the choral world for a long time. Um, and so I bring a lot of just kind of a mix up of all types of experience uh, to the table here. So this shouldn't come as a um, surprise to everybody, but the number one thing that um, I got out of my conversations uh, with every one of the venues was obviously that the loss of revenue for concert venues is absolutely devastating. 
Um, and even though you know concert venues have lost 100% of their revenue in some cases, um, they still have enormous operating costs. They still have to pay rent. They have to pay mortgage if they own the building. Um, they have to pay utilities. They have to pay a certain amount of staff. And so they've lost you know, anywhere from probably 50% to 100% of their revenue, depending on the type of venue. And they're still having a ton of expenses. Um, so we're going to talk about a, a couple challenges, but obviously revenue is a huge, huge one that they're facing right now and something that um, we're going to be working with them to hopefully overcome together. Just to share a couple of stories on this, um, just to kind of understand the revenue impact. Um, I heard from one person, Jane Moore is the director of booking and event services at the Morris Performing Arts Center. They had a three week run of the Lion King basically going on. And she said that the canceling of that one show, this was back in March, was a $1 million loss. Um, I spoke to another uh, performing arts center, it's called the Adrian Arsh Center in Florida. And they said that this year they'll re be reporting an $11 million loss. So a lot of money is at stake um, and venues are absolutely devastated by this as I know many of our organizations are as well. Um, but what's really interesting, what I found talking to venues is that the revenue impact is different and it's different by the type of venue. So um, churches, for example, they or faith-based organizations, temples and such, ticket revenue makes up a smaller piece of their revenue pie than um, you know concert venues that sell tickets and that's their main thing. So churches, faith-based organizations, they have a little bit more revenue coming in to support them. So this is a little bit different for them than you know a concert hall. Um, universities, schools, they're completely beholden to the institutional's financial standing. Um, it's sort of like they're separate, they're not quite separate entities, you know, they're totally within that school system. Um, so again, it's less of an important factor for them uh, in terms of their survivability because they rely on these larger institutions to, to keep them afloat. Um, parks and rec, permitting outdoor venues that are not separate, they're government funded, are also in a very different situation revenue wise because they are government funded. So again, there's this is sort of like not as important to them. What I found was that with the whole, you know, 20 sampling of venues that I talked to, was that the performing arts centers, the concert halls, the, the venues that serve performing arts organizations are the ones that are at most risk of being closed which obviously is very um, problematic for us because they're the ones that we rely on a lot of times for our venues. Um, so that was some a big key takeaway for me was that we're really at risk of losing those venues that cater to performing arts organizations uh, because the revenue impact is so devastating on them. They don't have other sources of income. They don't have a larger institution they're a part of. Um, so this is really, really scary. Um, and I think this puts the arts industry in a really dire situation um, and one that I, I'm hoping as a community we can all come together to um, solve because at the end of the day, when this is all over, if there is an over, I don't know what that looks like, uh, I think that we're going to find, and this was a common fear that they shared with me, that a lot of venues have had to close their doors, which means that we won't have as many venues available to us as well. Um, so. Very, very serious issue here um, that we're talking about. I want to talk a, a little bit about things other than revenue, too, some challenges that concert venues have uh, been facing that um, are impacting a lot of the ways that they're communicating with us. Um, so the first thing, obviously, is their revenue. They've had to completely cancel events, reschedule, postpone, et cetera, as we have had to do. But I think another thing is that um, like us as well, they're completely beholden to the government restrictions that are in place. Um, many of them, it, I tried to get different ge geographic locations, but in many of the cases, um, the government has either completely shut down performing arts venues where they can't even, they can't even rent out their venue for any type of event or even non-events. They're just completely closed down. Um, I've heard of situations where they're closed, but can have like a really, really limited number, talking like 25 or 50 people. 
uh, which obviously it's impossible to operate a venue and and have 25 you know people in the venue. So so basically, government restrictions are just making it completely impossible for um, some venues to open or open in an incredibly limited capacity, as as we all sort of I think expected and knew, but. Um, but what was really interesting about this was just how different it was across the board, depending on their geographic location. So um, that was really interesting to me. I think another challenge that they're having because of the revenue impacts and like some of our organizations as well, they're incredibly understaffed because they've had to lay off or furlough um, people. Um, I heard of one instance where there was a venue, I think I have them quoted later, they had 55 employees and they cut it down to eight. Um, others are operating as a you know one person show where there's really one person and no other staff members operating it. Um, so this is particularly really challenging because uh, it just makes it so that they obviously can't, uh, they don't have enough time to really work with, with you as a performing arts organization. Um, so the understaffing is a, is a really big challenge that they're facing. And in the midst of all this, they're also trying to restructure their business models with less staff. So it's just, you know, it's just one thing after another with them um, in terms of the challenges that they're facing. A couple other things, uh, it's just general uncertainty. Obviously, they don't know what's happening. They don't know what's going to happen in the future any more than we do. Another issue is the fear of the unknown or the technical fears. Um, I talked to a lot of venues who are like really great in getting live streaming equipment and things that they've never done before in the past. But there's also a big fear of going in that direction. I think a lot of people don't necessarily love to work with technology or they're afraid of technology. So knowing that they have to pivot to a virtual mindset is, is a really big barrier for many of them to overcome, especially if they've never had experience with that. And then the last kind of challenge that I heard across the board, particularly with like outdoor venues was, or if they're going into an outdoor space was obviously dealing with weather. Some of these um, outdoor venues that everyone's wanting to book are only seasonal depending on where they're located. So um, if you're doing a holiday concert or something like that, even the outdoor venues are not able to open uh, for that uh, either just because of the weather. So. A lot of real challenges here that are are making it hard to operate these venues um, and to plan any sort of in-person event, which has led to sort of major changes on their end. Um, as I mentioned before, they're having to furlough and lay off staff. They've had to reduce staff hours. They've had to do hiring freezes. Um, oh, here is the quote that I was mentioning. Um, the executive director of the Livermore Valley Performing Arts Center, Chris Carter, told me we had 55 people. Looks like we may have lost Tori for a bit, everyone. If you've got some questions or you want anyone have some things that they want to open up, I can give you some time to talk while Tori comes back on. If you want to share your cam, let me know. Sorry. There is. You're back. Sorry, I don't even know where I left off. <laughs> we were just gonna, you start where you want to start. I was just gonna open things up for people to ask questions. So you go ahead and do your screen leave again. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry about that. I've, this has been happening a couple times for whatever reason for me this weekend. So it might be my internet connection or something. Um, so major changes that they've had to do obviously is uh, for low layoff their staff completely restructure their staffing. They've had to completely cut um, expenses from their budgets. Um, and I've heard I've heard of some really crazy things that they've had to cut back on. But like even like some of these venues have um, vehicles and they're maintaining vehicles and they have to maintain insurance and everything. Some of them are literally like cutting collision insurance, like every single corner they're trying to cut, they're cutting. Um, and they're completely changing their business models to find new sources of income, live streaming, et cetera. And they're completely coming up with new protocols, proce operational procedures. Um, they're investing in safety equipment for when they return. So there's just so much that they're doing um, to ensure their survival and all with you know limited staff and limited revenue. 
um, which is amazing. And, and it's just, it's really just to highlight to you um, how dire the situation is and how much venues are doing everything in, they, in their power to make sure that they're on the other end of this and ready to you know, rent to you again. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the revenue that is currently making up um, these concert venues without performances, obviously. Um, and what I found really interesting about this, and I'm not sure why I didn't know this, uh, but I did not know this going in that most of the venues would be nonprofit organizations. And I think I didn't know this because, um, you know, I've never seen any of the concert venues in my area doing any fundraisers or anything like that. Um, so that was like so something that was very eye opening to me was that most of these are nonprofits. So what this means is that uh, people have completely shifted away from tickets and focused really on donations and fundraising. Most of the people I talked to said their largest source of income right now was individual donations um, or fundraising efforts. Um, so that was one piece of the puzzle. Uh, I know that I talked to one woman who is the social media and marketing manager. Her name's Kate Carson. Uh, she works at the Reeves Theater and Cafe. She said they did a fundraiser early on and raised like $18,000. And they actually weren't a nonprofit. So even commercial venues are starting to fundraise as well. Um, so I thought that, that was really interesting. Another thing that concert venues are uh, doing to bring in revenue is applying for a lot of grants, loans, and trying to get federal uh, relief in a variety of ways, including the Save Our Stages Act, which I mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of them also have sponsors in the same way that we have programmatic sponsors and things like that. They also have sponsors for their programming. If they have programming, some of them have sponsors for the venue itself. Um, one really, really great thing that I heard from several venues was that sponsors are still being really, really generous, even though they're not doing programming. So um, a lot of their sponsors have stayed on with them. They have continued to give um, with the exception of maybe smaller local companies. Um, one example was, you know, they had restaurants that were a sponsor and obviously the restaurant industry is hurting. So they had pulled, but a lot of them are still getting um, corporate sponsors, which is really, really great to hear. And people are being very generous, not only in the sponsorships, but also in the fundraising as well, which is great. Um, some of them are still getting revenue by renting out the space. Um, I would say the most common use cases I've heard for this is for live streaming events. They are still renting that out. I've heard of them renting out album recording sessions. Um, and they also have been doing um, like filming projects where people will come and film an intro with their music director or something like that for a fundraiser that the organ the choir is doing or something like that. So they still are renting out the space if they can. Um, and one thing that I thought was really, really interesting, which I think I'll probably talk about later too, is that in the past, uh, renting out a performance hall for doing like an album or a film project was really, really, really expensive. But now um, they've actually made it much more affordable because they're not bringing in any revenue. They don't have any events. So they're actually making their space a lot more affordable to come in and do these types of projects that you've never been able to do before. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and also, I don't know if you saw this, but AMC Theaters is now renting out their space for $100 private showings and things like that. And so I think it's not just with concert venues, but across the board, venues are opening up their space in more affordable ways, which could be to our benefit, which we'll talk a little bit about later too. And then the last piece of the revenue pie is that some are still getting some ticket sales in virtual events and things like that. Um, I will say that when I talk to venues about this, the ticket sales that they got were like breaking even for the events or they were more about a marketing opportunity than they were about actually bringing in revenue. So this is kind of what their, their revenue pie looks like. And I think that this is important for you to know when we're talking about partnership opportunities in the future. But of course, um, I like to quote Rick here a lot because he had a lot of really great, great quotes when I was talking to him. He's uh, really uh, just helpful. Um, Person, if you ever wanted to talk to someone, I'm sure he'd be willing to uh, talk to you. But anyway, he, you know, amidst all of this, even though donors are being generous, 
they're not the highest priority for donations, as I think a lot of us in the arts are also feeling that, you know, maybe there's other things going on in the world that are taking more of a priority. So even though people are still being very generous, it, it's you're still facing that challenge of, of trying to, um, you know, stay relevant. Um, so uh, I think the other issue is that, you know, concert venues are different, obviously, than performing arts organizations. They have different missions and things like that. I think choral organizations, we can have really strong missions and we have a product, which is our programming. Concert venues don't really have a product. It's their space. That's what their product is. So they don't have a product unless they do their own sort of programming. Um, so that was something that really resonated with me was just like, wow, they really don't have anything to give except for that physical space. And the government restrictions are making that impossible. And the pandemic's making that impossible. And all these things are making it impossible. So they're really, really um, struggling. A couple fears I want to share before we get into the good stuff, which is building partnerships with them. Um, I want to read a couple quotes to you. Shelly Brown, the president and CEO at State Theater Center for the Arts in Easton, Pennsylvania, said, my biggest fear is that we'll run out of money. There's only so long you can go waiting until they say you can reopen. We have bills and staff to pay. Um, and this was someone I spoke to that definitely was giving me like the real, like doom and gloom, like they're, you know, month to month trying to survive at this point. Um, so definitely the biggest fear for a lot of these venues is losing the venue entirely. And that's a reality. Um, I've already read in the news some people having to close their venues or relocate um, to somewhere else where they can afford to make rent. Um, so that is that is a reality. It's happening. It will probably continue to happen unless we can all come together and find ways to to keep them open, um, which is exactly what Save Our Stages is doing. Um, Another person, you know, just to share, my biggest fear is definitely the fear of losing the venue because no matter what anyone tells you, it costs a lot of money to run a venue. That was Marilyn Nash, owner of Can Be Pioneer Chapel. Um, so yeah, very real venue. Everyone had that fear, obviously. Another one is just the reality that even if they were to open up the venue um, to performing arts organizations, that audiences wouldn't come because of the fear of the pandemic, um, because of all these factors. They just don't think audiences will return, um, which obviously means that in the short term and maybe even the long term, who knows how long this will last, that their revenue will be impacted for a while. And as I was talking to these venues, it sounds like they already operate on very thin margins as it is. So that is a real fear that even once they start to reopen, they're not going to be getting um, the audiences that they used to have. So very, very scary from a revenue standpoint. And then just like, you know, the humanity of all of this, like really getting into their fears, a lot of them, you know, they've had to reduce all of their staff. They're worried about losing the venue. They're worried about losing their jobs too. So, um, you know, a lot of the people that you talk to, when we start to talk about building partnership opportunities, I think that these fears are really, really important um, to understand and know when you're talking to them, because it will just help us lead a little bit with more empathy, I would say. Um, so. Lots of fears, I would say these are the three main ones that everyone mentioned. Now, having said all the doom and gloom, <laughs> getting all the fears and challenges out of the way, almost every venue that I talked to said that they are very, very, very flexible now. And a lot of them have had the time to sort of sit, think through their reopening plans. Um, you know, it's been, gosh, what has it been like seven months since this pandemic started? I don't even know what, what is time anymore. But they've had the time to kind of sit, think, restructure, and now they've, they're very, very open and flexible to working with you, at least the ones that I spoke to, which obviously are motivated to surviving as well. Um, they still need revenue. They still want to support the arts. They want to bring programming to their communities. Um, I was really shocked with how many people I talked to that were so dedicated to the arts. Like they were almost like, not even worried about the venue as much as they're like, oh, I don't want the arts to die, you know? Um, so I think that that they're there to support you and they want to work with you. Um, I did have a few exceptions that I found to the rule. 
the biggest one being that union stage houses, stage hand like theaters and stuff, because they operate at such a high cost with union labor, they were the ones that were like, literally, we can't open our doors and run anything without a loss unless it's a full scale event. So those are the ones that I would say are the exception to the rule. Um, but I would say most as a rule of thumb, we're very, very flexible. Um, I do think that again, we're seeing that concert halls and performing arts have a higher level of motivation than the other uh, places because it is 100% of their revenue to open up their venues back to you. So again, the concert halls, performing arts centers, art spaces, those are the ones that are gonna be really, really, really um, flexible and open to working with you. Um, when I was when I was talking to them about the logistics of being flexible, um, I wanted to know like what does that mean <laughs> that you're flexible, you know? And they literally listed off every one of my hopes and desires that I would have expected them to do as a performing arts organization. So anything like Rick was saying, anything with deposits, they're flexible with. Like they don't want to get in a situation where you know an event's canceled with COVID nineteen and anyone's out any money. So everything they're being flexible with, they're being flexible with as much as they possibly can. Um, so that was a huge key takeaway for me was just like, don't be afraid of you know losing money or anything like that. Like they're being very flexible and you can have honest conversations about what that looks like with them. And um, I think that you'll both find that you're gonna be able to have something that's mutually beneficial. And in addition to being flexible, they're uh, very willing to be creative and they're craving sort of that in innovativeness, creativity, because they do want to keep their doors open and they have to find new ways of making revenue. So they're very open to this. And I think they want to hear as many ideas as they can. So um, if you have creative ideas, I encourage you to reach out to your venues and talk to them about this. Um, I talked about a few of these things, but the most creative uses of spaces that I'm hearing across the board is they're now investing in all of the equipment to do live streaming um, performances, live streaming, anything you want to do. They've now um, had time to invest in that technology and many, many of them are starting to do this already. Lots of filming projects and album recordings, all of that kind of stuff, they're very open to doing. And as I mentioned before, it's much more affordable than it was in the past in some cases. Um, obviously I haven't talked to every venue on the planet, but that's my understanding is that they're they're really just trying to rent it out as much as possible to get that revenue in. This is a big one that a lot of uh, like larger concert halls, large symphony halls, things like that are doing school educational programs. So what they're doing is they're bringing in artists to do filming uh, for curriculum for the schools because all of the schools are shifting to a virtual curriculum and the teachers don't necessarily have virtual curriculum available to them right away. So they're actually repackaging these educational programs in a virtual space, um, which I actually think is something really cool that you might be able to partner with them um, on. And we're going to talk a little bit about partnership opportunities as well. But this was something I heard a lot of uh, people doing. Some are actually <laughs> renting out their space for small private events, um, weddings, proms, that sort of thing. Same thing with movies, silent theater, they're doing that a lot. And then they're also renting out their space for like music lessons, dance classes, fitness classes, things like that. So even though they can't sell tickets, they can't bring in an audience, they are able to rent out that space in a lot of different ways. So I hope that this kind of has maybe gotten some ideas going. If you haven't taken advantage of working with venues yet and, and done any sort of creative programming, maybe this is starting to, um, you know, make you think of some of those opportunities. The most creative thing I heard was really, really cool. Um, there's a theater in Massachusetts that partnered with a local farm and they did, ding, 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 you guessed it, drive in, con or they did a drive in um, theatrical production. So the they partnered with the farm, they got um, the actors on stage, masks and everything like that. And then they brought in a bunch of cars for uh, a drive-in theatrical production. So um, now I know that there's probably a lot of different opinions about what that looks like, but I will say that that's definitely the most creative thing I heard of them doing. Um, so there's lots of different ideas going around, lots of creativity happening. 
um, cool stuff, I think. So this brings us into like, why did I just give you this whole spiel about <laughs> everything I've been into concert venues? We're performing arts organizations. Like, what do we need to do? So definitely, I think that partnerships are the key to everything um, to surviving this pandemic. I've talked about this before, where I think arts organizations themselves should partner together. And I definitely want to encourage everybody to try to find partnerships with their local concert venues to um, help them survive the pandemic and to help you survive the pandemic. Um, I actually spoke with several people about this. I want to just read one of the quotes um, from someone. Missy DiNuno, executive director of Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center said, the name of the game is partnership. Arts definitely have support, but we all have to figure out a way to work together to save our stages. Levering partner leveraging partnerships is going to be the name of the game in order to help each other. So uh, this is not just me saying this, this is concert venue saying they want to have a partnership with you um, to help you know, your organization and their organization survive. I also spoke with an artistic director, Christine Howlett from Capella Festiva. And she said, if you don't have a personal relationship with the venue, cultivate one. Call and be open to advice and ask questions and be supportive, leading with empathy. Um, these venues want you to be able to support, or these venues want to be able to support concerts and theater and whatever else, but they're also worrying about insurance costs, how many people they're allowed to serve and that sort of thing. So I definitely, definitely recommend um, trying to build a partnership with one of your local venues or more if you have the capacity. So what does that look like? I wrote a few ideas down for you. The sky is the limit really when it comes to partnerships. I'm sure that you can come up with many, many, many opportunities here. Um, but I wanted to throw out a few for you to consider. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the concert venues are nonprofit organizations, and even the commercial ones are still doing their own fundraisers um, and doing private donations. I don't actually know how that works, but they are doing that. So obviously, one of the first things that came to my mind was, you know, can a choir partner with a concert venue to do a joint fundraiser where they can split the proceeds, whatever that might be. It doesn't have to be an event. It doesn't have to be a live stream. It could be just a fundraiser where you're both tapping into each other's marketing channels. You're both announcing it. You're both supporting each other. Um, I think that this could just be an amazing, amazing opportunity um, to help each other out. Um, you know, definitely has the opportunity to bring in some press in your local area to do something like this, I would say. Um, so that was definitely something that I felt would be worthy of consideration. Um, another opportunity that I see is uh, joint programming. And this goes back to that farm example of there was a venue, there was actually a theatrical production company, and there was a farm where they all said, this is the programming we want to offer, we're going to sell tickets to it, and we're going to split the proceeds accordingly. Um, however they divvy that up, I don't know. But um, joint programming is a huge opportunity. As I mentioned uh, before, concert venues sometimes don't have their own programming. And so in, in because they don't have their product, as I mentioned, I think that this is a really great opportunity for them to be able to deliver product is to partner with a performing arts organization and offer a programming to their audiences. Um, so a couple ideas here, just um, doing a virtual season together where you use a concert venue as your exclusive um, sponsor or your exclusive space, however you wanna frame it. Um, virtual educational programming, as I mentioned, um, the educational programming that they're putting together for schools is huge right now. And something like that could be really great for your organization to get involved in. It could be a great community outreach project, obviously, and a way to partner with the venue and the local schools and your organization all together. Um, and then virtual festivals too, I think would be another um, joint programming opportunity. And actually NEVA, I mentioned the National Independent Venues Association, they have a festival going on this weekend um, and it's a music festival and a fundraiser for um, all of the venues on their list for their like emergency relief aid for the concert venues. So um, definitely a lot of cool ways that you could do like a virtual festival with different concerts, different performing arts organizations, use it as a fundraiser or sell tickets, whatever you wanna do there. Um, I thought that that could be a really great idea for programming. 
um, joint grant applications, or I should say joint, um, sort of like joint fundraisers, but more about um, soliciting funds from um, granting agencies and or sponsors or something like that. I think that, again, they're incredibly understaffed. I know that we're understaffed. I know that we also operate with volunteers, but sort of partnering together, let's say that you did do a joint programming, you can partner together to find sources of income for that programming. So anything you can do to help them in this area, I think would obviously be much appreciated. Joint marketing initiatives. Um, so this is something that's really, really easy to do. You don't have to have programming or anything like that. But you know, uh, from time to time to say like, hey, do you wanna be our partner in marketing initiatives? Switch emails, do email exchanges, do social posts together, um, you know, put a link to each other's websites on your, or sorry, yeah, websites on your website. Um, any sort of like joint opportunities where you can get your brand out to their audience and they can get their brand out to your audience. You can do all kinds of fun things with this. Um, so again, something I think there's a lot of ideas behind here that could probably come to fruition and, and be exciting and help you both expand your reach um, to different communities. I think another um, opportunity is that you could do space, space and ticket sales exchanges meaning that um, everyone's looking for revenue and everyone's looking for that mutual beneficial piece of this, of this partnership. I think that venues obviously have the space that they can offer you um, and they could charge you for it or they could offer it to you and do a ticket sales exchange with your programming. So let's say that um, you decided to sell tickets and maybe you just rented their space for live stream or you just they just donated the space for your live stream and then you split the ticket sales proceeds with them. I thought that that was something that could potentially be successful. And then my last partnership opportunity, even though I'm sure there's a million, um, is to advocate together locally. So I would encourage you and your concert venues to pair up and talk to your local representatives about getting local and or national funding for both performing arts organizations and concert venues. Um, I would continue to, you know, collaborate together with any local arts advocacy groups you have. Um, and I think a lot of them, as much as I know that we're all like trying to raise our own money, but a lot of them obviously would also encourage any sort of help getting donations in and that sort of thing. So I think advocate slash donate is obviously a great way to um, partner with them. So this is sort of my last slide before I get to, um, Q&A, um, talked a lot about the challenges and fears that venues are facing, and we talked about some ways you can partner with them. Um, but going back to that initial problem that I was saying that performing arts organizations were getting this lack of communication from concert venues, um, I decided to put together this last slide to sort of help you think through how are you gonna make those initial outreaches, or sorry, those initial outreach. Um, I can't talk today, I can never talk, I swear. Uh, but anyway, how you can get the conversation going. So the first thing that I obviously want to say here, and I want to go into this a little bit more, is have a plan when you talk to them. Um, and when I say have a plan, I would start from the understanding of their fears and challenges and then try to address their fears and challenges in your plan. So we said that their main fears are losing the venue, losing their job, and audiences not attending. Their challenges are lost revenue, government restrictions, they're understaffed, uncertain technical fears and weather. So when you're preparing a plan, lay out some of the things that you're gonna do to help them overcome those challenges. Um, and I've actually heard from them specifically for some of these ideas. So one would be to lay out the estimated revenue that will that their organization will get from this event or whatever it is that you're planning lay out exactly how you're going to get an audience there if you have any data from that if your audience members have you've surveyed them perhaps and you know that they're you know willing to do these types of programming with you share that information with them share the time it's going to take to coordinate something like this if you can and or any of the help that they're gonna have to plan it. So if they are understaffed, if you know that their staff has gone down to one person, you can say, we've got a crew of 10 volunteers who have agreed to lead this initiative. We're gonna do everything in our power to keep the, the time to a minimum. That would be helpful for them to know upfront in order to get a response. 
They want to know that you're going to take safety precautions. Did I cut out again? <laughs> nope. I just okay. <laughs> um, was I was nice. like, oh no. <laughs> um, they want to know that you're going to take safety precautions and that you're going to follow the government restrictions because obviously, um, if they're not following that, it's illegal. They don't want to do that. So make sure that you lay out exactly that you know the government restrictions are X. We're absolutely going to follow X, and these are the precautions that we've already agreed to take. And we're obviously open to anything that you have as well for safety precautions. So we've talked about revenue, audience, time, safety precautions, and government restrictions. Um, if they, if it is a venue that has technical fears, and you have a technical team, say, hey, we know you're worried about the technical stuff. We've got it. That would help them too, I think, um, get back to you. And then for the weather, any sort of plan B or alternatives you have, if it is an outdoor space and they're worried about you using it in maybe December or something like that, um, if you have a backup plan, if you have weather um, you know, logistics that you put in place that can make them feel more at ease of renting that space to you, then include that in your proposal or your plan to them. So I think it's important to just sort of do your homework and understand you know, if I want to work with this venue, I understand that these are the challenges that venue is facing. And I'm going to tell them right up front that I know this, that I'm going to do everything in our power to minimize those challenges. And we still want to talk to them. Um, if you just go in kind of like without any sort of plan, they might just not get back to you. I think another thing, if you don't have like a full proposal, if you if you're going to reach out to somebody that you don't have a connection with, a venue that you don't have a connection with, leading from that place of empathy. It doesn't have to be like, we have programming, we want to go, we want to rent you, here's our plan. It can also just be like, how are you? <laughs> you know, we're talking to the venues in our area because we want to help you survive. Like, is there anything we can do to help you? Um, and I think that that's going to get a really positive response for you too, um, if you're struggling to communicate with them. So that's my suggestion there, have a plan and or lead from empathy, learn more about what they're trying to do. Everyone said, please keep booking with us. <laughs> um, booking with them does a couple things. Um, and, and when I say booking, I mean in any way you can. You could book for two years down the line with them for an actual event. You could book a live stream. You could rent the space, whatever it is to bring them revenue. Um, but it does a couple things for them. It shows uh, that, that their venue is obviously committed to survival. Um, so when they talk to sponsors or anything like that, they can say, you know, we've got this on our calendar. We're planning to be here at the end of this pandemic. It just shows that they're going to be there um, if they can point to something that they have on their calendar. It obviously helps them bring in revenue in the short term and the long term. Um, so and it just shows their general commitment to the arts and helps them also um, budget as well. So I would say keep booking, keep putting things on their calendar as much as possible. They do want that because it is their revenue. They do want to point to it, as I said, to sponsors and donors and things like that. Um, another way that you can help venues is obviously communicate. I know this is something that we're all experts in, I'm sure, but um, communicate to the best of your ability to with them. The one thing I heard from a lot of them is be patient because they are understaffed. And I actually talked to a few of them about not communicating back to performing arts organizations. And they were literally like, we want to talk to them. We are just so understaffed. We haven't been able to. Um, so they are there for you. Even if you're not hearing from them, it could just be because they have so much going on that they haven't been able to get back to you. Um, so be patient, they said. Um, don't assume they don't want to work with you. I've talked to a lot of organizations in Boston, and I think a lot of us are feeling, I guess, downtrodden, maybe, or like kind of hopeless a little bit. Um, like, oh, you know, we want to blame the venue sometimes, like, oh, they don't want to work with us. But we haven't actually really talked to them about it, and we haven't really done our due diligence in every instance. So I would say don't assume that they don't want to work with you. Um, you've got to ask. You've got to try to talk to them first. Um, and one thing that um, someone said too to me, uh, you know, they said every venue looks at things differently. So even if you're not getting answers from a, a venue or you've gotten a no from a venue, you've gotten a, we're not going to work with you at all. 
that doesn't mean other venues are going to say the same thing. So there's other types of venues that will be willing to work with you. You just got to find them. Um, and as I was mentioning earlier, I, I think those venues are the concert halls, the performing art spaces, those kinds of things. They're the ones who, who have the most. And it looks like we lost her again, everyone. You know what? I would, if you've got questions, why don't you start queuing them up in the section? Or if you would like to be brought in and share your cam and mic. Oh, there's Tori. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, keep, feel free to queue up the questions too. Um, I don't know where I left off. I don't know when I blacked out or not. <laughs> uh, but I think my long saga was here, here was just to stay, uh, stay in touch with them. But also communicating means, you know, subscribing to their newsletters, reading the local news to stay informed of what's going on with their venues. You'll be able to find, you know, whether they're having fundraisers or um, whether a, a venue is at risk of closing. Those are the types of stories that will be in the media or they'll be in their newsletters. So just stay informed, I would say, is part of, you know, communicating. And then the last thing, as I mentioned before, is advocate, advocate, advocate for not only your organization, but the arts as a whole, the entire enter entertainment industry, the concert venues in particular, because they are your partners. You know, without them, we would not be able to put out our product. So continue to advocate with them. Um, I highly recommend going to saveourstages.com. And you can also check out their music festival that's going on this weekend um, to learn more about the bill. Um, and the legislature that's going through because uh, it's very possible that your local area might not know about it. So sharing that information with your local representatives and things like that is one thing that you can do to help advocate. Share information about any relief funds that are helpful for venues. Participate in any relief funds that are there for venues. Um, and donate if you can. Um, if you're able to donate to a concert venue to make sure that they're there on the other end. And you've obviously donated to your organization as well. Um, you know, I would encourage you to do that as well. Um, we're all in this together, and um, I do agree that I think partnerships are the way forward, and we have to just work together and help each other um, make it through. So I would love to hear a little bit more from this group of people in terms of what are some of the challenges that you've been facing working with venues. What's your experience been like? Have they gotten back to you? Is, are there any creative programming ideas you've got going? Anything like that, I'd really love to um, hear. Well, the first question that I'm seeing right now from Anthony Alston, Tori, is if you could reshare your slides. Now, is oh, no. That, is that the doc called Working With Venues? Yes, sorry about that. Okay, I just when found I left, you that, Anthony. <laughs> so there's a link there for you. Sorry, when I cut out, I forgot to reshare it. <laughs> but here's the final slide here. Have a plan, keep booking, communicate, and advocate. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I just wanted to kind of hear from you all um, to see what's going on. Have any of you had partnerships with venues? Any creative programming? Any of you planning in-person performances? Anything like that? Well, I was wondering the same thing, actually. I see... Uh... Uh, Mark and Rick from South Florida, and I see uh, Justin from Washington, D.C., and some folks from Sacramento. I'd be curious to see what's happening in your uh, communities right now and what you're doing. I mean, the key to this whole thing is to look at, for the chorus, to look at what assets they have and what they can share with these venues and mm -hmm. uh, what they bring to the table rather than simply mm -hmm. being a client. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we definitely have that customer mentality. <laughs> like they're serving us, but they might not be there to serve us, <laughs> you know, at yeah. the other end of this. Yeah, no, we're this not is, all in it together. This is about shared success these days, isn't it? Exactly. Well, I'm not seeing anyone. Let's see. Don't be shy, folks. If you want to share your cam, ask. I'll let you, I'll bring you on. Ooh, yes, the, the Ronald just said that there are no in-person concerts till next summer. I mean, I think that's actually the case for a lot of our communities, isn't it? it but, but I think a lot of us also need to be planning out and be looking to create these relationships now. Because when we do get to perform, 
there'll be a clamoring that's happening. And so yeah. uh, we've got to start the partnerships now. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. And, and just one thing to add to that, I mean, what's stopping people from doing joint marketing or joint fundraising together in the meantime while you're not performing? Because that's gonna strengthen your relationship with them. And when there is a clamor to get back, they're gonna prioritize your organization <laughs> to make sure that you get your concerts in. Well, I've, we've got some comments here. Emily Marin says that they had a local, local group perform at a drive-in. The stage is too small for us, but they had a full parking lot. And nice. yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. I've heard of a lot of drive-in performances. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. They're just opening up here now in Palm Springs. It was a little too hot this summer to do it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Kim Whitmore. I was recently part of the virtual fundraiser with the Boston Sing Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And the dance party was on Zoom and Twitter simultaneously and was a success in their minds. That's a creative approach, Kim. I love that. Yes. Do you have a link to that, Kim? Kim, it'd be great if I you were to share you. that. Let's see. And Janine Perry, we've worked with a high school and they are just locked down. Not sure how we can change that multi-level involvement. That's tough yeah. when they're locked down right now. But uh, yeah. I would imagine there's someone there still answering phones, Janine. Wouldn't you think so, Tori? And that yeah. you just have to be patient and keep reaching out until somebody responds. Yeah, I mean, schools and universities are definitely tricky because uh, like the venue or the art staff oftentimes don't necessarily have a say in what's going on. Um, so trying to, you know, get to the top of whoever's at that institution is, is definitely tricky. Um, and this is something that I've recently talked to a friend of mine about, uh, which is like, how do you make the case for whatever it is you're trying to do that the institute, so these institutions, they make decisions for us. They make decisions for their venues and they make decisions for the arts. They don't necessarily have the data they don't know the performing arts aerosol studies that's out there. They don't know these things. So it's like, how do you make the case to advocate for that within the institution? Um, and that, there's a whole lot of things we could talk about there, but I think that we're gonna do some content about that hopefully in the future. Very cool. I bet you will. You've always got great content. Um, Rick Vaughn says, our major venues are available, but restricted to 30% seating with rents at the same level in order for them to break even. The cost of an individual ticket is prohibitive. Rick, where are you? Will you type that in? That there's that they're booking at the same cost. Game in score San Francisco. Oh wow. Mm. So they're not being flexible at all with the, the price of rent, it sounds like. Oh Rick Vaughn says oh, oh. South Florida, excuse me. South Florida. Thank you, Rick. My, um, yes, Game in score South Florida. Wow. So that's for Lauderdale area and so on. Okay. Mm. I would be curious if they have, they had any successful programming or is nobody booking because like if, if they're making it hard for you to rent, presumably other organizations are also struggling to rent. So are they seeing any programming? Are they, are they successful? Not sure. Yeah. Interesting. And Kim Whitmore has posted a link here for us. So if you want, you oh, can, Copy and paste that somewhere. And I'm copying it now, so I don't open it right now. And uh, Kevin Thompson says that they've traditionally used churches as their venues in Buffalo. Yeah. I've, I've, the churches, the few churches that I spoke to have been um, really receptive to working with you as well. One really interesting thing is that they're operating with two restrictions. The first is they are required to do worship gathering restrictions, and then the other is performing arts. So anything that's part of a worship is actually, I believe, more lenient in most cases than the performing arts restrictions. So if, it's interesting because if it is an arts thing during their worship ceremonies, they can get away <laughs> with a lot more than um, like a separate concert that they're hosting, which I thought was interesting. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Any other questions coming up here? Yeah, it's really it's really interesting to read all of these and, and learn more about what's going on. Um, that's really disappointing to what you're facing down in South Florida, that they're using the same prices. That it doesn't seem like they're really being a community partner. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It doesn't sound like they're. Um, and I wonder which venues these are. So, I definitely recommend if you haven't already 
if you go to saveourstages.org or .com and check out their venues list, I think that these venues might be a little bit more motivated to work with you because they are sort of leading the charge and making sure that they can um, stay alive. Got it. Oh, there are a couple of clarifications here. Florida is fully open, so they're likely operating as if everything were pre-COVID. Well, <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. Um, <laughs> wow. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, we're still in lockdown in my town. All right. Um, yeah. Well. I, I think that I, yes, the, Kim is just sharing the, like, Save Our Stages NEVA members, the, the concert venues that are members of NEVA. Um, yeah, I think that the, the advice that I'm getting from the venues is look for other ones that are willing to work with you. And, you know, you never know, you might actually build a better partnership with a different type of venue that you haven't had before. Um, so I think they're out there, but I would be really curious to hear, like, if you've, you know, done everything in your power to reach out to every venue in your area and you're just getting no, 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 no. I would be really curious to hear about that. Um, and yeah, email me at any time. I'm, I'd be very curious to talk to you, Tori at chorusconnection.com. Because maybe, maybe like me writing an article about them not being flexible will help <laughs> make them a little bit more flexible. <laughs> I can tell you a lot of them talk to me because, you know, I led with a, this is exposure for you and your cause. I'm going to, I'm going to share this with uh, Gala Choruses and I'm going to share this on our blog later too. So for them, it's like, again, we're, I'm trying to find that mutually beneficial um, connection to get them to talk to me. And when people see that there's a win-win or that, or, I mean, I was in sales for 35 years, but when they saw that there was something in it for them. Yeah. They were usually very generous with sharing. Exactly. But, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, if there's no questions or anything like that, um, I just wanted to share with you all the link to some additional resources here. Um, here's a link to download the slides, uh, bit.ly slash working with venues. And then there's a couple resources on our blog that I wanted to point you to. Once you download the slides, you can click on these links. Um, but there's a couple blogs that talk about the questions you should ask your concert venues. And then there's a blog that's, that makes the case um, to concert venues about what we need from them. So if you're not getting answers for them, that might be a potential resource you could point to and say like, you know, this is the stuff that we're trying to do. Can you help us? Are you willing to be a partner? Um, so these are some resources that I thought could be helpful. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tori. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing with us today.